Okay, moving right along. Uh, in addition to being a co-maintainer of the BPF with uh, Alexi uh, and preparing the BPF track for Thursday, he was helping me with the networking track as well, and he brought his laptop to help with this. So uh, Daniel's contributions are numerous and valuable, and I really appreciate all the effort he's put into helping make everything great in the Linux networking and BPF subsystems. Um, today he's going to talk about KTLS and layering and all the issues that we have to fight with that and how we're going to resolve it, and he's going to get some help from John Fastapen. So it uh, should be interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so today I would like to talk about the, jo the work that uh, John and myself have been doing over uh, recently on combining um, KTLS with BPF so that we can do policy enforcement there. First, a little bit of background. Um, wh wh why all this? So basically, right now in the industry, we see a shift where enterprises um, split their monolithic application into so-called microservices in the distributed level. What is a microservice? That's basically a service that does one simple thing well. It communicates over the network, and it's built and managed independently by independent teams. Basically, like the old Unix philosophy just brought into enterprise service world and whatnot. The key motivation why this is uh, so popular right now, this design pattern, is basically that it allows enterprises that they can um, to have basically more speed, scale, and agility so that they can um, react faster to the market because of that. And those microservices that can be implemented in whatever language you like, but they have one lowest common um, Denomin uh, denominator to communicate with each other, and that is an API. And that's typically uh, REST API over HTTP. And it also allows them to outsource various things. For example, you have Stripe for payment processing and Twilio for messaging and so on. You can see some examples of those APIs. And the basic idea is that the microservice itself becomes easier to develop, debug, and deploy. So you just uh, have test cases against the API and see what the outcome is. Uh, but uh, the big downside or like or the big challenge in that sense is that you have a higher operational complexity because you need to take care of all the security policies, load balancing, scaling policies, and all of that. And there's a platform that um, helps basically in deploying, uh, scaling, and operating all of this, which is called Kubernetes. At the heart of all of this is, of course, the Linux kernel. And in Kubernetes, you have uh, um, some, some entities which are called pods. Those are basically a combination of uh, C groups and namespaces that can contain one or multiple containers. And basically, they share a common policy. For example, security policy or policy how you roll out a particular service. Um, and while we've talked a lot about uh, XDP, uh, here at the networking track, we, we shouldn't forget that the TCP stack, uh, TCP IP stack and the whole socket layer is a fundamental uh, thing, and it, it's the communication bus for the microservices. Um, in terms of network policy, uh, what, what is used in Kubernetes by default is IP tables. Uh, the good thing is this is available on, on all the kernels, of course. Um, and more or less well understood. Um, here's a fun quote from one of the earlier uh, core Docker maintainers that you heard at some conference. <laughs> um, but the big problem with that is that in, an, in a world where you only communicate through APIs, basically the ports, the L L3, L4, uh, more or less become meaningless because you either have to open up everything or you have to expose everything from that particular port. Um, or you just don't, but usually you want to have some more fine-grained uh, policy for accessing parts of the API. So as a consequence of that is that there are now several um, proxies, um, L L7 proxies, that manage uh, the API communication. And they are typically injected as a transparent sidecar into every part. So um, as you can see from the, from the picture here, 
uh, you have a service inside a Kubernetes pod and um, an instance of a proxy. Here it's an Envoy proxy as one example. And if one service wants to talk to another, they basically have to traverse the networking stack six times. And that, that is what is used and deployed today. So I'm not making it up. <laughs> um, and that is, of course, a huge cost. Uh, because, well, you pack it first, goes to the proxy, then to, to the remote proxy from the remote part, and that proxy, once again, uh, pushes the message to the actual service you want to talk to. And, of course, in times where you have kernel page table isolation and red bully mitigations and everything, this is quite bad. Um, those sidecar proxies, um, such as Envoy, they uh, also provide additional features on top of that. For example, health checks, service discovery, load balancing, or mutual TLS, which is quite nice because, and I think that's one reason why they're also so popular, because you don't have to change your application. You get this feature automatically because all the traffic goes through that particular proxy. Um, so for example, you don't have to care about encryption. They just proxy to proxy communicates over TLS. Uh, but um, we, we think it, it makes, of course, sense to um, uh, speed up that fast path and, for example, uh, to augment it with BPF support in terms of policy enforcement, introspection, and redirection. So you don't have to traverse networking stack six times, but only actually two times. And, and how are we doing that? Um, so one option is to um, have PPF at the socket layer. So basically you have a special uh, PPF map, which is called SOC map, and an, an orchestration daemon uh, can, can use that and can put a socket into that map. And basically then uh, the socket callbacks are replaced and a so-called PSOC is attached on top of that, which holds additional metadata uh, that is relevant in order to execute BPF at that layer. Uh, for example, if you look at the ingress path, um, when such a socket is in that mode, basically the packet goes normally through the TCP stack and then it passes through a stream parser. In the stream parser we have two BPF programs. Uh, one is uh, SKB parser, another one is SKB verdict. They were basically inherited from the BPF map and uh, the SKB parser is basically there so that the BPF program um, can make a decision on how much data has to be queued in order to reach a verdict. And then the second program, the verdict, is there to, actual, to actually make that action. Um, action can be a drop or pass action. And once it passes, it's basically put into a um, backlog. Uh, worker into a backlog worker. Uh, so you, you have, uh, th that's basically one of the cues from the, uh, thank you, uh, from the, <laughs> is it off? Is it? All right. Um, so that's basically put into a ingress SKP queue, which is attached on the PSOC. And that worker will then internally uh, convert that into a so-called SOC message. What it exactly is, uh, we, will hear later, um, we will hear later on. And once the application calls uh, the uh, receive message, then it will basically get picked up, the SOC message uh, from that uh, ingress queue. And basically in, internally in that SOC message, you have a, a scatter list ring and, and we have like um, some start and end pointers and then basically copy the data to user space depending on um, where they are located. The egress path is quite similar. Uh, whenever an application does a send message, send page is um, more or less similar to, to, um, to that. Either you have already a SOC message that is corked on that particular PSOC or you create a new one. Um, you would uh, zero copy uh, those pages uh, when, when, whenever possible, or if not, then you have to allocate some buffer from the socket in order to later on mem copy that data over. And then in the end, you call, the, you call a BPF verdict 
um, program, which will then decide that either the packet is dropped or it's passed onwards to, for transmission to the TCP stack, or it will decide, okay, I don't have enough data, I have to cork that uh, SOC message. So for the next send message call, maybe then I can enforce a policy. And then and the PPF program for that is called MSG Parser. It's also inherited from the um, SOC map. And yeah, and now we make a switch to KTLS and ULP, and later on go and how these two connect to each other. Um, basically, uh, kernel TLS, uh, how it operates, it basically does the uh, TLS handshake in user space, and then the remaining work is transferred into the kernel. Uh, the nice thing is that you can have zero copies that you don't need on send page, for example, a bounce buffer. Um, it goes back and forth to user space to just to do the en en encryption. There are a couple of modes in kernel TLS. Uh, it's software-based or hardware-based. When you have the uh, uh, software-based mode, then the encryption and decryption goes through the normal kernel crypto layer. You can have it on RX and TX. And for the hardware, uh, I think there's now uh, one nick uh, from Mellanox, which does the offloading on RX and TX as well. Right now, um, the most common setup is supported, which is TLS 1.2 in AS GCM mode and 128-bit key size. And the whole uh, KTLS operates basically transparent to the application in the sense that an SSL library such as OpenSSL uh, will just do all the setup in the background. And um, soon, uh, since TLS 1.3 uh, uh, finished standardization, I believe, uh, it will also be supported in, in, the, in the kernel, as well as other key sizes larger than 128 bits. So that is a uh, work in progress. Um, basically, the upper layer protocol, like how this is glued onto a socket, um, provides such a selector. So that um, it's basically a very thin layer uh, where you can have a module that registers to the ULP. and then replaces a couple of callbacks. In, in the case for KTLS, the way you would set it up uh, can be seen here. So first you register uh, for your socket that you want to use KTLS with it. And then um, you have some <coughs> control data structure, uh, which is filled out by libraries such as OpenSSL once the handshake completed, where you can define the TLS version, uh, the key size, the actual key, and various other information, then you can enable it on transmission or receive or in both at the same time. So be before our work uh, got merged, basically both the KTLS but also the BPF, uh, which was operating in the socket layer, were both using ULP, which was a problem because you can only pick one of those two, but you cannot use those two in combination. So we are thinking whether um, stacking would make sense, but on the other hand, you have even more layers of indirection and more complexity if you want to make it really generic. So it wasn't an optimal path. So we basically decided to refactor and tear the old BPF SOC map code apart, basically into three things. So one is a generic SK message API in order to manage the, the data, the scatter gathering, uh, that you get from user space um, or push to user space. And another one was the PSOC framework itself, where TCP is one implementation of it. Um, it works, of course, on top of SK messages. And the other one, which can be completely isolated, um, is the actual BPF map. Uh, so we, right now we have an array and a hash map for that, where sockets are attached to. So basically, the idea is that the SK message and the PSOC framework works across ULPs. It's not an individual ULP, it works across the, the whole layer. And um, before the SOC message, uh, the old SOC message code was using ULP, uh, the ULP layer, it was basically using it in a little bit of a hackish way that it's only in kernel, so it's you could not select it from user space, but only from inside the kernel. And right now it's like keeping the ULP layer as, the, as it was originally um, intended to. And with that, we have basically have 
uh, with, with, with that re refactoring, um, we could also put the SK message handling into KTLS, which was not using it before. And so now both operate on the same context, which is really good for BPF because you can enable to use it there. Uh, it also helped to remove a bunch of open coded code in the, in the KTLS layer for transmission because the plain text and the encryption handling was also working on SGLIS, basically. And how that operates, um, well, John will continue on that. Okay, working? All right, great. Um, okay, so thanks, Daniel. I'll uh, talk about how the KTLS works with the BPF. Um, so this is sort of a, a flow through the transmit side. Uh, and what you can see at the top is we hook into the SYN message call, which is the TLS software SYN message. So this is how the, the actual ULPs plug into the, um, into the socket layer. So every time you do a SYN message uh, from your user space application, you'll then now call the TLS software SYN message hook and not the generic TCP hook. Um, we show the SYN message case here, and it's very similar, but we also do the SYN page hook. So if you call SYN file, well, we have the same um, introspection. Um, with one detail that I'll get to in just a second. So what, what the first thing that the TLS will do is it'll build a, a record of the TLS um, that is gonna keep the context. And the reason it has to have a, a sort of a, um, a context that it keeps is because of this encryption layer. So it's going to encrypt it and then it might um, keep it across system calls. And I'll explain why that is possible. But um, we need to have something that stays even after the system call returns. And, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the next thing it'll do is it'll uh, allocate a encrypted message. And so this is just where it's going to encrypt the plain text into the, the encrypted text. So you get a, a block of memory for that. And then the next couple of points are sort of interesting. This third block here, the SK message zero copy from iter. So because we already have a block of memory in kernel that we're going to copy the plain text into when we do the encryption, or as we're doing the encryption, we don't need to do a copy right away from user space into the kernel into the kernel, into the encrypted block, and have two copies there. So the TLS layer tries to do a zero copy, so we just fill out the um, SK message, which is the standardized structure that we built across the BPF sock map code and the KTLS code, so now we have this common layer. Um, but if that can't be done for some reason, uh, and this tends to be because the, there's not enough room in the, in the uh, scatter gather list that we're building, or, or for, there's a couple other error cases that this happens, so then you may need to actually do this copy which is the SK message mem copy from iter um, two blocks down. And this will actually copy it from user space. And if you hit this case, you actually do two copies in this path. You'll do a copy from user space to kernel, kernel to the encrypted block. Um, we really try to avoid this at all costs, but this is sort of the, you know, in edge cases, in air cases, when you're under memory pressure, you actually will hit this. Um, and there's also one case that we can fire this off from, um, from the BPF side as well, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. So once you have this, um, SK message structure, which I'll, I'll give you the sort of deep, deep details of it in the next slide. But basically, you have a scatter gather list of memory that came from user. So the user will say, here's a list of blocks just like the IO vec that you pass down through the send message call. Or in the, if it's a send page call or send file, you'll have the, the page and the, um, and the offset and the length, which will just be kind of represented in this uh, scatter gather list as well. So once that goes in, that goes into this SKP sock message verdict uh, block. And what's really nice about this work that uh, Daniel and I did at this point is that this block is sort of the same whether or not the SK message came from KTLS or it came from the just normal SYN message. So we've sort of unified all this kind of pieces and as Daniel noted, we tore it apart into three pieces and we can just kind of call directly into this because KTLS now uses this sort of standardized format. Um, so if you happen to be writing new ULVs and you use the same format, you can get all these same benefits all the helper calls are available to you, and you can also plumb into BPF straight like, using the helper calls that we have. So interestingly, if this socket is, is a BPF socket, it's been attached to a SOC map, and the map itself will have a BPF program attached to it, and this BPF program here is the message parser. That program will be run, and that program can have a, a set of verdicts, um, drop or pass, and uh, I'll leave cork out for right now, and we'll cover that in, in the next couple slides. Um, if it's dropped, we just return to the user uh, an error code, uh, e-access at the moment. Um, there's a bit of an interesting case where the, um, uh, you can drop only part of the message. You may send the first half and then drop the next half. And the reason we do this is because 
a user may, um, at the API level, say, I have four API calls, pack them all into one send message call, and then send the whole block down. And from a policy perspective, you know, two of those may be okay, and then the next two may be bad. And so when this happens, the verdict can say, two or these first two are good, the third one is bad, I'm throwing an error on the third one. And what happens then is we will send the first two out, and we will return the correct return value to the user indicating that we sent you know, five of the 10 bytes. And then the user can try to resend. And then at that point, we'll give an e-access because there'll be no more valid data to send on our side. Um, and and this, this happens actually quite frequently. Most applications are trying to pack as much as they can into a send message um, call at a time to get multiple API calls going at, you know, in, at, at once. Um, if we do a pass, at that point, you know, the policy later has said this is good. This is a good packet to send or a good message to send. And we'll push it down to the crypto layer. And this is sort of the unique part about KTLS with BPF is that we have this crypto layer underneath. If this was uh, just the SOC map BPF normal send message without KTLS, this would then send to send message the, the normal TCP stack at that point. Okay. So this is the sort of the, the guts of how this works. Um, this is our kind of common structure. We have two pieces of it. We have the SK message scatter gather list, which is the list of all the data. Um, and then we have the, the higher level structure, with the, which is the SK message. Inside the scatter gather list, we have sort of what you would expect from a, a ring of scatter gather elements. We have the, the ring which itself, which is the struct scatter list here. And we have a mac, max message frags at this point. Um, we have a start, an end, and a current. So the current is, is sort of interesting because it's keeping track of how far you've processed in the message. Um, and the, the reason that this is there is because of the cork behavior, and I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, we have a size so that we keep track of the overall size, and this is just mostly for memory accounting, so we know how much to free, how much, to, uh, how much memory we've allocated through the process. And then we have a, um, a, copy, a copy bool here, boolean. Uh, this is interesting because in the zero copy case, coming either from send page or because we've optimized the send message, and we're running on the policy. We need to ensure that the user, we don't have a race with the user. If you're running policy and it's on a zero copy page, there's nothing to stop the user from modifying the, the message as you're doing the policy. And so uh, from a, a strict policy point of view, you have a race here where you might, uh, you being the person who wrote the BPF program, might agree that this message is a valid message to send, but it's still in, owned by the application. And at that point, the application can change data and get it back after it's gone through the policy. So, if your policy will touch certain bytes or read certain bytes in the, um, in the message, we have a helper call that will then pull the data in and copy it. And this is, works quite well compared to the, the, sort of the very initial version one of this. I just copied all of the data in, right? And this is, this is a huge performance hit because we're, we're taking all of the messages, copying them twice, versus now we just copy the very specific sections that you need to read or write to. So if you have a header on a, 4K message, you can copy the header in, read the header, say the next 4K is good, and it'll all go through without ever doing this double copy buffer. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, down here in the actual structure, we have um, these two interesting things called apply bytes and cork bytes. And the reason we need these is for two reasons. The first case, apply bytes, is perhaps the easier to understand. We go back to the header case. So you have a header with a 4K message. You actually don't care how many send message calls that 4K header takes. So if you have a message that has a header, a whole bunch of data, you may not want to ever have BPF touch the, the payload, just the headers. And so we have this apply bytes where the BPF program can specify how many bytes to send through the system without ever calling the BPF verdict machine again. And in this way, we can kind of get do efficient large transfers. Um, without having to continuously call BPF. It also stops sort of some bad application behavior where maybe they send one byte at a time. Like in the worst, no application would ever, should ever do this probably. But you know, we have to handle this at the API level. And we don't want a user to be able to force the BPF execution on every byte of a packet because it's quite, it's kind of expensive in terms of kind of the overall system. Um, cork bytes is, is almost the opposite case. So this sort of user might not send the entire header that you need to read in in the first initial send message. So if, if the application, and, and we actually see this in practice where um, it's like a proxy that's um, collecting a bunch of API calls, and it might do one big send message when it reaches its sort of um, 
whatever its limit of, of kind of buffer space is, it'll send it out. And you might have half a header, which you can't make a policy decision on, but you don't want to pass it along because you don't know it's good yet from your policy perspective. So what we do is we have an API um, BPF helper that says, please um, do, not, uh, do not forward this data until I receive the next n bytes. And in this way, you can say I have a 10 byte header. I only have five bytes of it. Please give me the next five bytes. I'm not going to send any of this data until I see the entire header and OK the, uh, based on the policy. Uh, and so those are the kind of the main things there. Um, we also allow uh, redirects from there. And this kind of comes from the CLS layer. That's sort of a similar idea where at the TC CLS layer, which is the, um, um, the SKB kind of implementation of this, not the SOC map, we have the ability to redirect to other interfaces. At the socket layer, layer, we wanted a very similar thing where we could redirect to other sockets. Um, and so we have a helper call that says, okay, redirect to other sockets, and then we stash all this stuff in the, these kind of struct socks at the bottom of the SK message here so that when we pass it down, we can find the right sock that we want to redirect to and put it in the receive queue or the transmit queue of that socket. Um, this is how we uh, uh, sort of accelerate this three <coughs> passes or six passes through the TCP stack through down to one or two. So here's a list of the helpers. Uh, this is the user-facing side. So if you're writing BPF programs, these are the helpers that you have used. These will then be translated into that structure in the right, right places. So as we talked about, we have a BPF message apply bytes. This is how, like we said, we can say we want in bytes before we make them, um, without making any BPF verdict on it. We just already have okayed it. Uh, we have this cork bytes, which will allow you to, as we say, get more data before you get called back into the BPF uh, uh, program. We have uh, the redirect map, very similar to how we did the XDP dev re redirect map, which I think we talked about uh, yesterday. Um, basically, you have a map full of sockets. You do a redirect. You give it an index or a hash <coughs> into that map. It'll look up whatever socket happens to be in that uh, slot, and it'll do a redirect either to the TX or the either the egress or the ingress based on the flags provided. So it's, it's very, very similar to the APIs that we already have in XDP layer, the TC layer, and now in the socket layer. So pull and push data is, is interesting. Um, the pull data is for the zero copy case. So if you want to read or write data and you want to, and you need to ensure that it's actually copied, you can do a pull data on bytes A through B. Um, it can be sort of, it doesn't have to be from the head uh, onward, it can be in the middle, so you could do four by four through six, for example. And it'll pull just those two bytes in, in that case. Um, if the data has already been copied, the API is smart enough not to recopy it. So it's light. Um, it doesn't, it tries to be intelligent. So if you're writing your program for sort of ease of use and you know you're always gonna copy this, you don't have to check to see if it's copied. You just make this call, it'll jump out to the helper. The helper will then say, oh, that data's already there. I don't need to do anything and give you back control. Push data is an interesting one. So this is, I, I think we talk about this going the other way again from the XDP side um, where you, we wanna be able to push stuff into the metadata header so that you can read it and further up the stack. This is similar but going the other way. So now instead of coming from the, the wire, we're coming from the application. Um, you may want to push um, some metadata that you're gonna read later um, in the stack. So we have a, a push data which lets you put some arbitrary number of bytes in the, um, in the message at some location. Uh, interesting, slight, uh, interesting case here, um, which is different from XDP. So XDP always has the data at the head. Here we can insert data sort of arbitrarily in the packet. Because we have a scatter gather list, it's pretty easy to tear it apart and insert data in the middle. This lets you do um, sort of interesting things like maybe you want to add a, an option into the header or a flag or field or something. So a lot of head headers will have optional fields. You could stick something in there if you wanted to. Um, and then we have all of the normal BPF base helpers as well. So these are, all, well, I should say all of the ones that apply to this. So not the SKB ones, obviously, because the, we have no SKB and not the XDP ones because we don't have any XDP. So that's fun, that's all the low-level details. So the question now is, how does this all work? Uh, Daniel and I both work on a, a project called Cilium, and Daniel talked about it um, kind of earlier. The behind, so what this will do then is it provides a kind of high-level integration with the orchestration layer, and under the covers, we'll use all of the BPF layers. And what's, what's sort of really interesting about this, I think, in my opinion, is that we're using basically all of the BPF hooks on the networking side all the way from XDP, which will get you your low-level networking, up to the socket layer now. So we have L, you know, basically L2 at the bottom, we have the TC hooks, and now we have the socket layer hooks. So we can get uh, very 
you know, insert, insert our policy either at the socket side or at the mix side or at the uh, interface side as well. Um, and now we have this additional piece where with KTLS running, we can run our policy, then do the crypto and have a full um, kind of KTLS encryption with policy, um, which is, is I think interesting to note because it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been possible until this. Before, if something was encrypted by TLS um, in user space, there's no way to do policy at the microservice API level. Um, so we have a, still have a bunch of work to do. Um, we've managed to get this first point here where we can now do enforcement with TLS. We have a bunch of things on our list to do. Um, we have a GitHub page with lots of issues and things um, to, fi to features mostly at this point. Um, some helpers would be useful. Some things like being able to figure out what C group the socket belongs to without walking proc structures and things to figure this out would be would really great. Those actually exist in other um, BPF hooks, just not in, in our, we haven't added them to sock map yet. Um, the, stir, the string parser, which is the ingress side of this piece, uh, is currently, needs some optimization. It's a little bit slower than the TX side, so we spend a fair amount of time optimizing the egress path um, because a lot of our policies are built on egress, but we also have policies on ingress as well, and um, they're sort of not optimized yet, um, so there's some work to do there. Um, as Daniel noted, the KTLS right now works with this you know, one specific set of keys. Fortunately, this is kind of a very, this is a very common one. Um, most of the sort of exposed APIs that I've tested, uh, Twitter and um, some of the AWS stuff and some of the, the Facebook APIs seem to auto-negotiate to this, this version, so that's okay. Um, but you know that we still have room to get the rest of the keys in, TLS 1.3 and so on. Um, interestingly, the OpenSSL PR is out now and I, hopefully winding up. We're getting close, I think, to having it all resolved. There's a few more comments that need to be there, but once that's in, it'll be part of the standard uh, OpenSSL lib to use the KTLS support. And the other piece to note is, is we'll talk about tomorrow at the uh, at the microconference. Yeah, the BPF microconference. Thanks. Um, is bounded loops. So we've gone through some effort to avoid loops in Cilium as well, and also more specifically in the so in the sock map kind of layer. Um, and, and we make do, and we're able to get around it, but it would be really nice if we could kind of make more complex programs. Uh, and if you look at the Cilium code, you'll see some of these cases where we have macros that try to ensure that we don't optimize into loops and things in the code. Um, and it'd be nice to just clean all that up and, get, and, and uh, you know, kind of have a support for loops. Oops, all right, great. Thank you, guys. So basically the whole point is that you get to see the clear text and then you call into the TLS ULP to do all its whatever it does and it's operating on the same key message structures that you're using to pass into the BPF programs and whatnot so it's completely integrated with the same infrastructure. Yeah. So that's great. Exactly. Cool. <coughs> Any questions out there? It's a pretty interesting piece of technology in talking, integrating many different diverse areas of the networking stack from the actual stack itself to the KTLS layer to our friend BPF, which we don't talk about enough. Uh, so, someone's got to be curious about the implications or whatever m moving forward, what we can do with this, or, or you're just so blown away that you can't come up with anything to ask. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, any ideas about how this stuff integrates with any kind of hardware offload support, look aside support in the kernel, look aside APIs, there's already offloaders that can do this encryption for you. Um, is it better just to do it on the CPU? What do you think? Um, there's, there's maybe like the raw performance question about what is, it, like is the CPU faster than the hardware offload and moving the data around? But from our perspective, we're doing um, a lot of policy enforcement written in BPF. So the question would be, how does the hardware know how to do the policy that's written in BPF before the encryption? But uh, to clarify, I mean, once you push yeah. it to the KTLS ULP, it would do the offloading stuff that the KTLS uh, layer would do already. Right. So I guess if, if, we, if it's okay, 
to do the policy first, and then when we push it to the, the TLS record down, and we do offloading at that point, yes. it's sort of yeah. below us. And you gotta I mean, for the transmission, that would work, yeah. right? For the ingress side, probably not. Yeah, receive, the problem is you need to see the plain text, yeah. and that you, the cart is before the horse, so to speak, so. Yeah, we haven't, I guess, we haven't tried it. Maybe on TX it just works. So know. if we had a really interesting piece of hardware <laughs> that could run the policy enforcement and then do the KLS, and yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> Anyways, any other questions? Nope. Willem. This might be a very basic question that everyone else understands. Um, I see that the, like, the six stack path is kind of crazy. Um, there's, there's basically data that goes out the machine host to another host, and there's data that basically stays within the host. I see um, with KTLS, and this is the part that I just don't fully understand yet, are you doing all the policy enforcement that you would normally do in Envoy in the kernel and send it out right away, so it's one transmission? And or are you forwarding between sockets as of TCP friends, which was uh, like a, lo a long time ago a proposal to basically short circuit the stack, but still deliver it locally and do all the enforcement in user space? Right. So, so the implementation in Cilium leverages Envoy, so they work. It works all, every all. If we have a layer seven policy, like an HTTP policy that's thrown through Envoy, mm -hmm. we will then um, do the socket redirect directly to the Envoy proxy. Okay. Um, and then the encryption happens from that point onwards. And then the encryption happens yeah. from that point onwa onwards, yeah. Um, so, so that piece is already in Cilium, and the Cilium itself doesn't do any sort of HTTP parsing, for example, which would be done by Envoy. So the, the idea would be to accelerate Envoy and not try to somehow do what it's doing. The, the other trouble is Envoy does a lot more than just parsing. It'll do routing and keep alive and these kinds of things that we would so, want so to that's short circuit. Is the, um, the KTLS part from an Envoy out on the network? And is the socket forwarding so between the service and, and Envoy, which is intercepting traffic that the service is not aware is being intercepted? Right, so th there's two ways to do it with KTLS. One is we the KTLS does it on the Envoy, Envoy to network side. Mm -hmm. Right, and then the other one would be to do it um, from the service side as well, and in that case we have to take the packet back from Envoy and put it back in the TLS, uh, take it back to be encrypted in the socket. Okay. Um, Thanks. Maybe, maybe a whiteboard would help. I'm trying to like draw <laughs> it here. Right behind you. Oh. <laughs> oh, there's a marker. Uh, oh. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm just <laughs> so. I said that, and there's a whiteboard behind me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't say there's time constraints. You got 11 minutes. I got 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the, the, I guess the main point is that the, if, the, if you do a send message from a service and you have KTLS on, it'll go to the policy. If the policy needs to redirect to a proxy, it can uh -huh. do that. And then when the proxy sends it, we can send it back to do t KTLS on that socket. I see. And, and then this way we get the user, the policy and Envoy, and we do the send with, with KTLS. So it's sort of transparent at that point. Okay. And we avoid the, the, the other way to do it, which can be done today, is you can encrypt it from the service, then decrypt it on Envoy, and then re-encrypt it. And this is even worse than using you know six TCP stacks, because now you've encrypted, decrypted, encrypted, decrypted. <laughs> Maybe one more time, I'm not sure. All right, thanks. Cool. Well, let's see. So the question is, uh, can you do something like uh, transparent encryption with this? Like when the application was not using TLS before, but with this redirect, you redirect into socket that doing KTLS. Yes, so you would, one way to think of that would be if every node has a TLS to every other node, so you have like a TLS mesh. Basically, we can take, the service will send packets normally unencrypted, and we can do a redirect to the, once we know where it, to send it, we can put it on the 
um, which we'll know because we have the whole sock struct there. We can put it on the right egress socket that has TLS to the wherever node it's sending it to and do sort of a full um, kind of transparent KTLS sort of mesh. I think the other thing that might also be interesting is to have um, in kernel TLS termination or something like that, for example, from from XDP potentially, or you know, yeah, might also look into that. Anyone else? Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.